Okay. First, can you can you see the screen? Probably yes. Eh? Yes, I so, can see your screen. Okay. So uh, thank you for uh, this invitation. So today um, I will speak about uh, open big data, artificial intelligence, and healthy longevity. And this I will speak about this uh, to show you how we could, I think, progress uh, and make uh, clinical trials possible to have a uh, uh, maximal lifespan and uh, average lifespan uh, longer in a not so far future. Um, I want to begin with a few facts uh, about uh, human longevity. Maybe you know already about a few of them, but uh, let's uh, say, let's begin with the most important one. The most important one is uh, today, like uh, every day, about uh, 110,000 people, 10,000 people will die of diseases related to old age. So uh, among these uh, more than 100,000 people, probably about uh, 10,000, five to 10,000 about this famous disease called uh, COVID-19. So what's the death toll, the death toll of aging? So in a country like uh, Belgium, about 90% of people dying are dying of diseases related to old age. So what would happen if there was no old, old age in, in Belgium? So the average person would live for 500 to 1,000 years. The life expectancy of the, the chance of dying for a young woman of 17 to 20 years nowadays in Belgium is one on 1,000. So old age is really the first cause of death uh, in a country like Belgium, far from all other causes of death but also in the world. In the world, more than two thirds of the deaths are related to diseases concerning aging. And even in the poorest countries in the world, it is still the first cause of death, killing, let's say, about 50% of the population. Like you probably know, life expectancy is rising. The average lifespan is now in the world about 70 years, in countries like Belgium about 80 years, and it continues to rise uh, about three months a year. It, it rises about three months a year since more than one century in all countries, and since about, uh, well, a little bit less than one century in poorer countries. The, it's still rising even in our countries, but it's rising faster in poorer countries than in uh, our countries. So when we die of old age, we die of three main causes of uh, uh, three main kind of diseases, cardiovascular diseases, where the situation is improving quite rapidly. The mortality uh, for people on, uh, of one class of age is diminishing with uh, about 50% the last uh, 30 or 40 years. We are dying also of uh, cancer. Their situation is also improving fast. Uh, for one class of age, the mortality is uh, uh, decreasing about 1% each year. And we die also of neurogenitive diseases. And there the situation is not improving. Well, it's a little bit improving but neurodegenerative diseases are the diseases that we still absolutely not can cure in, uh, at, the, at the actual level of uh, medical knowledge. But the, the elephant in the room, the thing that we sometimes don't uh, understand is that actually almost all diseases are related to old age also infectious diseases like flu, like tuberculosis, and uh, like uh, COVID-19 uh, are strongly related to old age. Even when people are falling, uh, if uh, uh, young people are falling, the chance that they are going to die is almost nothing. If old people are, are falling and, uh, uh, for example, breaking a leg, the probability that they will die uh, quite soon is very high. 
So once again, this is the first, first cause of that is related to old age and old age is a very, very complex uh, thing that we don't understand uh, correctly yet. This is a, a schema of the system biology of human aging about what we know about aging at the moment. This is, called, this is made by a scientist called John Ferber and each year he's adapting uh, his uh, schema and you see that there are lots of lots of uh, uh, interrelated uh, questions that uh, we, we have of course today no time to develop. Um, now that, wa that, that was a few facts about uh, uh, the average lifespan. Now a few facts about maximal lifespan that actually most people um, have more, less knowledge about maximal lifespan and about uh, um, average lifespan. So the first important aspect is maximal lifespan is almost not going up, almost not. So the first person who to reach the age of 100 years was probably, or maybe uh, Terencia. And Terencia was the widow of uh, uh, Cicero and she died uh, more than 2000 years ago when she was 104 years old. So, and uh, the oldest person ever, she, uh, she, uh, the, her name was Jeanne Calment and she died when she was 120 years old in 1997. So the progression there is only, is less than 20 years. And the oldest person in the world now is only 118 years. And the oldest man in the world now is only 111 years. So you see that they are, there is no real progression for the maximal lifespan. So since uh, thousands of years, there are already people uh, living 90, 100, and even 100 years. And of course, like I said already, there is no uh, real progression for Alzheimer's disease. So if we live long enough at the moment, we probably, if we were to live more than 100 years, uh, almost everybody would have Alzheimer's disease at one time. What we know about maximal lifespan is that it is genetically determined and very precisely. So if you give 2000, well, $1 billion to the, the, the best scientists in the world and you tell him, please keep these mice uh, alive as long as possible, they will never live more than four or maybe five years, never. There is nothing to do. Uh, if you uh, take the, if you, if you were able to do the same experiment for a very long time with uh, some uh, kind of um, uh, reptiles like uh, the, the turtles in uh, the Galapagos, it, they could live for uh, probably 200, 200 years. So this is genetically, the maximal lifespan is genetically determined and strongly and that's why the, the maximal lifespan is much higher for, one of the aspects is that the maximal lifespan is much higher for women than for men. And we also know that genetically related animals can have very different lifespans. For example, let's take one uh, group of animals, the chameleons. So the, uh, the species with the shortest lifespan of all vertebrates is one of kind of uh, chameleon uh, that can live only for a few months, six months or about six months. And there are other chameleons. So it's a chameleon in Madagascar and there are other chameleons in Madagascar. They can live for 10 years. So very similar uh, animals can live for very uh, different lifespan. What, do, what uh, we don't know about maximal lifespan is the first and most important question is, why is it until now not possible to prolong maximal lifespan when we can prolong average lifespan with the, the uh, actual uh, medical progress? We don't know yet if there are gene therapies possible against aging. Well, for humans, we have already some gene therapies or some, uh, let's say, gene chains who are possible 
who are possible to use for making uh, some uh, rats uh, or some uh, flies living longer. We don't know if there are products able to prolong, uh, uh, to prolong maximal lifespan. So probably uh, the classical progress pro products to prolong lifespan like uh, cellulitics, metformin of rapamycin are not working for the maximal lifespan, but we don't know if there is something working. And uh, we don't know yet, uh, or uh, oh, I, I hope yet, if there are other uh, therapies that we could develop like nanotechnology, microsecurity, regeneration to uh, prolong maximal lifespan. Okay, now I'm coming to the, the first, uh, let's say, uh, biggest part of uh, my small speech conference today. It's about uh, uh, big data. So big data and health. Well, you probably read already uh, quite a few things about uh, big data. So where is the information concerning uh, big data and health? Um, of course, in the scientific literature, there are thousands and thousands of uh, scientific articles concerning uh, medical questions. Also uh, in, uh, in your smartphone and the smartphone of billions of people and, uh, and uh, in the information um, that uh, tech giants uh, have about you, uh, through social net networks, for example, but also for the biggest part, there are uh, probably for all of you here, gigas of uh, medical information in administrations and uh, in medical and, and even more in medical institutions, in hospitals, uh, in the health sector, in social security, and so on. So what can we do with this? So we could uh, think, uh, and uh, that's one of the projects of uh, one uh, person who is here, we could uh, try to, uh, uh, let's say, uh, to go through internet and to use artificial intelligence to find uh, new information, new scientific information. Uh, there is one uh, software who is supposed to do that for scientific literature. It's called uh, IBM Watson, IBM Watson for Health. But uh, this uh, software uh, and this, uh, let's say, uh, computer applications were very promising when they were first used, but at the moment, they are not uh, uh, beautiful results yet, sadly. Now, the most uh, promising aspects, at least at the European level, is to have to organize open access to, uh, to help big data. And for this, there is a very, very positive uh, declaration. So maybe you heard about the fact that uh, uh, at the European level, there is a discussion going on concerning uh, the use of artificial intelligence, the risk related uh, uh, to artificial intelligence, but there is also a part studied by the commission and the European parliament concerning the hopes of artificial intelligence and one part about health. And there in the text called the Fostering a European Art, uh, Approach to Artificial Intelligence, there is the explicit goal that by 2025, citizens from all the member states uh, uh, should be able to share the health data with healthcare providers and authorities of their choices, uh, of their choice, sorry. So I think this would be absolutely uh, beautiful if it was a fact. Technically, it's probably uh, possible, but uh, practically at the moment, it's not at all a fact. Uh, so even in Belgium, even in the best countries like uh, Finland, uh, it's still difficult to really share your health data, uh, even with, uh, with your medical doctor. And it's still very complicated or almost impossible to share your health data uh, to, to make it possible for to progress for, health, for, for scientific uh, research. In uh, uh, concerning health big data, so there are many organizations in Europe, but also in other countries who are really specifically, um, who have really specifically for goal 
to make it possible to share data. So you have uh, at the European level, the European health data space. In Finland, that's probably the most promising organization, uh, FinData. In France, you have the Health Data Hub. In Estonia, you have eEstonia. Estonia is uh, uh, very uh, uh, often uh, one of the leading uh, countries for everything related to, um, to um, let's say, uh, e-development, uh, e-government, and so on. And in Belgium, you have uh, Health Data. Uh, let's take two examples. I will not go in details for all, all of these uh, organization, organizations, but uh, concerning uh, FinData, they have a system where uh, normally to share your data, you have one, one system called opting uh, out. So it means that the citizens, if they don't want to share the health data, they have to say, no, I don't want. And it seems to be working very good because uh, um, almost all citizens uh, accept to share the health data. Uh, so normally, uh, Finland is the best country in, the, uh, in uh, Europe and maybe in the world uh, to share health data, maybe with Estonia, actually. But Estonia, I don't know enough about the situation to, to tell you. But what I can, I can say also that for me, uh, sadly, the, the the worst or the, the less developed uh, uh, place is probably France. Not because they don't have the good organization. They have a good organization called Health Data Hub with a beautiful website. Uh, they have also uh, more health data uh, organized uh, by the state than probably almost all countries in the world or most countries, uh, at least in Europe. But they have a very complicated way to uh, authorize, to make it uh, possible for people to uh, got access, to get access to the, the, the data. So uh, for example, until 2020, there were 516 um, scientists or organization asking to access the data. And there were only uh, eight, eight organizations or uh, projects who were approved. So this is, a, for me, a totally, uh, let's say, unlogical situation. There are only also many places, um, many places online where the goal is to share, uh, let's say, big data, you, uh, the health uh, data. But these are private organizations, and there is, up to the moment, almost no cooperation. So like I said uh, before, you have a lot of uh, this uh, uh, big data. Uh, if you have an Apple Watch, you share without really uh, knowing with, uh, which people you are sharing. If you have a Garmin Watch, it's the same. Uh, in the world, it seems that uh, there are 400,000 medical apps at the moment. Uh, many of these apps, or if not most of the, well, most of these apps are measuring uh, health data, but you don't know also where it is uh, going. There is uh, one uh, initiative called uh, the Healthcare Data Institute, another one close uh, Microsoft closing the data divide, another one co called uh, Data Safe uh, Saves Lives, and one other one called uh, Citizen with two eyes. All these initiatives have uh, one goal to share health data, but uh, they are not, there is not enough coordination. And for most of these initiatives, uh, it's really not, uh, not yet more, uh, not yet uh, possible to share, uh, to really share the share health data. Why? Why? There are, I would say, uh, at least two aspects. One is GDPR, G the General Data Regulation Protection. And uh, let's say the, the fact that at the moment, uh, privacy is becoming kind of, uh, especially in Belgium, uh, kind of a very, very uh, uh, central point that, that very important for everybody. And I think uh, privacy is of course something important, but privacy should not be uh, stopping people uh, to share their health data. Uh, for scientific reasons. And actually, 
if you take a look at the GD, uh, GDPR, uh, if you take a look at the, the laws there, normally there are exceptions for scientific uh, research and normally there are also exceptions in uh, times of uh, uh, big uh, health problems like uh, COVID-19 was one uh, case, but practically uh, they are, the situation is still very, very difficult. And uh, because of the, the second aspect, I would say it's social acceptation, social acceptation of sharing health data. And one big problem is because people are always afraid and some, sometimes, but not so many times, uh, rightly afraid about uh, that their health data would be used for uh, private goals or would be used, uh, I would say, uh, between brackets uh, against them. Uh, to sell uh, products or to, uh, to uh, ask more for the insurance and so on. So one uh, representative of the European Commission in November 2009 said it, I think, uh, the right way. Uh, he, uh, he or she, I don't know anymore, uh, said uh, regulation must focus especially on the ethical usage of data to ensure that the health data is used only for health and research purposes and not for other aspects. So this should be, in my opinion, the goal of the uh, privacy rules, nothing more, nothing less, but also nothing more. One other big problems of uh, uh, big data at the moment is what's called, sometimes called uh, trash in, trash out. It means that when you have, um, non-correct information going in the system, you have also bad information going out of the system. This is not always like that. You know, when, uh, for example, you Google and you make a typo, uh, you Google with one letter not correct, one or two or even three letters not correct, Google will, will find you the correct information. But when you uh, use uh, software for health uh, and you make a small mistake, in many, many cases, uh, big data will also be, uh, let's say, uh, perverted or will also be not corrected, not correct. I will give one, uh, okay, uh, I continue. And one of the problems behind that is that uh, for the medical sector, you don't have one leader, you have many, many uh, commercial software uh, working uh, in one sector, but not in other, other one sector. Uh, most uh, medical institutions are private organizations or organizations who are not working directly in collaboration with uh, other, uh, other clinic, clinics, other uh, medical centers and so on. So for example, I, I give you one example of uh, one typical situation. So you have in one, um, in one institution, one software scanning for information about cancers, and in one other um, institution, one other software scanning also about cancers, but with a slightly different size software. And let's say the, the color that you have is slightly different. And also, let's say in one hospital, you have more cancers, and in the other hospital, you have less cancers just because of the situation. Uh, of what the hospital is following. So after a while, when you push big data together, you will have, because of this uh, color slightly change, the software, let's say learning that the different color means more cancers. And of course, in the practic uh, practically that is totally uh, wrong. And this is something uh, really problematic with big data and with uh, uh, big, uh, the, the old software trying to, um, to analyze uh, big data is that they don't have enough data coming from uh, different institutions. And so, um, yeah, so the results are, are bad. A few examples about what we, we don't know about uh, big data in one specific uh, uh, aspect, uh, COVID-19, COVID-19 and big data. It's incredible, well, how many things we still don't know. So about uh, COVID-19, we have, no, I don't know, probably more than 100 million, well, no, or you have 
billions of people uh, who received vaccination, billions of people who were analyzed concerning uh, do they have COVID or not. And still there are so many things that we don't know. We don't know about fatality rate of the various uh, uh, degree of contaminations, uh, number of asymptomatic carriers and so on and so on. Um, and one of the main reasons is for this big data that we have, we don't have the same ways to uh, analyze it, uh, following the countries, following the companies, following uh, the software and so on. And we even don't know, of course, and sadly, how to cure the virus. We don't know about reinfection after vaccination. We don't know, or we, we know not enough. Of course, we don't know about more than six months or one year because there was no vaccination before, but we even don't know uh, really about efficiency on the short term. We don't know so much about the uh, effect of antibodies and antiviral. And there was this big controversy concerning chloroquine uh, that was, let's say, interesting, showing that big data in science, uh, especially in health, that in health data, is not working very good uh, yet. And we don't know about the effects of other drugs. So as I said, uh, I think one of the major problems is uh, uh, sharing data, sharing data publicly. There was uh, this already uh, about one year ago, a beautiful call from the president of Costa Rica. And it was also uh, made by other institutions. And it was also uh, partly made by the WHO, the World uh, Health Organization. So the idea was to have uh, uh, more open data. So you can see the, the text there, but uh, sadly it was, and it is still not uh, the fact uh, uh, that uh, big uh, health data concerning COVID-19 is really available for the, for the scientists. Now, this, uh, this was it for the, let's say, the, the first part of my uh, speech. Uh, now the second part is about, will be shorter. It's about what do we need uh, for clinical tests for longevity once we have enough data and enough, uh, let's say, uh, therapies possible. So we live in a, in a strange world. We have more scientists than ever in the history of humanity. But we have also more bureaucracy than ever in the history of humanity. Uh, and one of the consequences uh, that uh, to test a new drug in Europe or in the United States, the cost is now about 1 billion euro. This is primarily due to uh, heavy regulation in the US, but also uh, in Europe, but also in the US. And so we need a, a less bureaucratic and a faster system, especially a faster system of authorization. At, the, at least at the European level or at the American level and in the best world situation at the world level. At the moment, an average uh, IRB, so ad, an IRB that it's uh, the ethical organization in the USA, but that's the same situation in, uh, in countries like in European countries. So the average uh, ethical authorizations takes many, many months. And when you have this authorization to test new products, it's mostly only valid in one place. So even in very good, con very good, very well organized countries like Germany, if you have the authorization in one land, you need one state, a uh, German state, you need an authorization if you want uh, to make a clinical test in a, another, uh, other state, you need also an authorization. We need also a paradigm uh, shift. Uh, we need scientists to become aware of some scientists because some scientists uh, know about it to become aware that uh, if we uh, use enough energy it's probably possible to uh, defeat rela the disease related to old age globally we need some kind of a moonshot Manhattan project uh, with clin clinical trials larger i will come back and uh, also we need a narrative you know about uh, longevity heroes about uh, people uh, working together to defeat uh, uh, aging. At the moment, there are almost no clinical tests in the world really working on 
uh, on aging itself. Uh, until uh, one or two years ago, one problem was that uh, in the international classification of disease, ICD, there was almost nothing concerning uh, specifically old age. This changed, but still, there are still not many tests, tests concerning aging. And when you have tests, uh, these tests are not with, uh, mostly not with very old people. I will come back to this. What we need is double blind tests, of course. Um, so one group with the best uh, available treatment at the moment, and one group with the best available treatment and a new therapy, and maybe one or more groups with uh, new therapies, because there, are, uh, more than, there is more than one uh, new therapy that you can uh, think about. And I insist that in this situation, uh, the both groups, so both uh, groups of people following the new therapies uh, would be in a better situation than ordinary people because they would be followed by, uh, by medical doctors, by scientists, by clinicians. We need volunteers who are old enough. So 70, 80, even 95 for uh, um, old people for men, even uh, 99 for women because women have uh, uh, can, uh, can be longer in relatively good health. Of course, well informed enough and uh, interested for themselves and also for the community, for the world community, I, could, I would say. We need to have uh, good products or therapies. So these are uh, uh, the beginning of the list, the products that we already know have some impact uh, of have probably some impact uh, of aging, metformin, rapamycin, senolytics, and even the aspirin. Uh, we can use also combination pills. Blood uh, therapies are somehow very promising. Gene therapies, like I said, uh, for me, it's the most uh, promising uh, um, perspective, but at the moment, there are no gene therapies that we know about that we, that we know that can uh, fight against aging for human beings. And then there are all things that we don't know yet, but that we will uh, discover. We need uh, good biomarkers. So we have a kind of a list uh, uh, in, uh, at the end of uh, this uh, slide. So capacity markers, uh, genetic markers, and of, uh, of course, and non-genetic markers. We need that to have that before the treatment, during the treatment, and after the treatment. And we need, this is important, to have uh, always public results. Because at the moment, when uh, private companies are doing uh, tests on aging, if the tests uh, don't have good results, they don't publish it. So uh, if, for example, I don't know, if they, they were already uh, blood uh, clinical uh, test on uh, um, blood exchange, then maybe they, they were already, but uh, if the, the results are not published, other people will try again, other scientists will try again, and they will lose time, and they will lose energy, and uh, it will not be useful. So we need a, a global project. Like we had uh, the, the project of the first man on the moon, there was uh, uh, 12 years between the decision to go to the moon and the first, uh, uh, no, there, there were 12 years be be between the first step, the, the first uh, uh, object in the space and the first man in the, uh, on the moon. It's so incredible that uh, even many people today think that uh, that's untrue. So when there is a common goal, uh, the science can progress incredibly, uh, incredibly fast. And there are, there are more than 100,000 people that we could save uh, each day. We need, of course, money. So at the European level or at the US level or in uh, private institutions. So at the private uh, level, there are two big uh, initiatives called Google Calico and called Charles Zuckerberg initiative, when normally there is a lot of money 
to uh, defeat uh, diseases, especially diseases related to old age for Google Calico. And there are also many startups. I think in my personal point of view that there are too many uh, startups actually. Now, a few words about a possible closed future. So we think we I will come back to the organizations at the at the end of the uh, the speech. Uh, we think that it is very probably possible to find a tra treatment globally against aging within 15 to 30 to 30 years. But it would be it will be or it would be we don't know complicated and expensive and asking. Every, uh, among other things, all aspects that I was already approaching. Of course, we should use uh, artificial intelligence to progress in these directions. This, this would be a long story. I will not uh, go in details uh, today, except what I said uh, about uh, big data. And what I personally uh, wish, it's no patent because I know many people and maybe you will ask this question after, after uh, at the end of the, the, this. Uh, yeah, but uh, are you not afraid that uh, these therapies will be for rich only? I think that the risk is not uh, very heavy, but I think also that it's important that uh, at least for everything that is paid with public money, there is no uh, patents that the, that we have a situation, uh, let's say, patent left situation, to avoid uh, inequalities for new therapies, and this is also my uh, conclusion. Because before uh, I hope uh, the many questions that you are going to ask, this is also my conclusion. So, more equality and more equity tomorrow for all people is probably the most important question. The most important aspect that you can imagine for equality, well, not only in rich countries, but in the world, uh, because even the richest person in the world uh, today, uh, if he or she is more than 50 years old, his life expectancy is less than the poorest country, the, the, sorry, the poorest uh, person in the poorest country in the world who is just uh, born. A baby, uh, even in a sub-Saharan country, very poor sub-Saharan country, a baby has a life expectancy of uh, at least uh, 50 years, and an uh, old person of uh, 60 to 70 years has no life expectancy of 50 years, less than that. I also uh, think that there is, uh, in, in the Belgium law, in, in, in the law of other uh, Latin countries, you have uh, this legal obligation that's called the duty to rescue. If you can save people, you are obliged to save them, even if it costs you a little bit of money. So uh, more largely, you could say that there is a, a, a legal or at least a moral obligation for scientists and for authorities to make science progress, to make it possible for people to live longer. It's also, uh, there is also one article of the United, uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, Article 27.2, uh, that say that uh, the citizens have the right to uh, benefit, to, to benefit of uh, uh, civil, sorry, and of scientific uh, advancements. And one of the most important scientific advancements in at the moment is uh, uh, health and longevity. We have a conference uh, uh, September 9, 2021, conference on big data, AI, and healthy longevity, and, and healthy longevity, excuse me. Uh, and our goal so is to contribute uh, to create a system trusted by citizens where, by default, opt out, all health data can be used for scientific research. And once, like I said already, and not for any other use with the final goal to make everybody able to live a healthier life uh, for longer, even much longer. So that's all now before the most important and most interesting part of the discussion, uh, the discussion with you. Uh, so if you want uh, more information, you can take a look uh, at the two, the three websites here heels.org that's partly in French and partly also in Dutch, but first in English. 
longevityareads.org, lifespan.io. Um, and you can also su subscribe to the, e the newsletter, The Death of Debt. So it's free for the two first centuries after you have to pay. Oh. Thank you. I stop sharing. So please. Well, thank you very much, uh, Didier, for sharing your presentation. These many questions, I think many avenues for, for, for thoughts. Um, um, I would like to first, um, if I may, start uh, the discussion with the question that you mentioned that made me also there about uh, what you mentioned about uh, inequalities. Uh, about a um, no, no, no. Uh, if you allow me to to frame my mind. Sorry. About what you mentioned at the, at the beginning of your presentation. What you mentioned was that um, uh, one of the biggest uh, obstacles, if I understood correctly, from uh, longevity research is that longevity is defined by genetic factors. So it, it, it yes. seems for me that um, from, from your presentation, I missed the point about, well, okay, we can develop different therapeutics, we can work on changing paradigms, or so we can start also to develop different ways to monitor people data, give them permission to opt in or opt out. But the main problem, as you mentioned, is the longevity is a genetic factor. So I wonder how can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Yes. Um, yeah. So first, uh, you're totally right. Uh, I always insist on this, uh, the uh, maximal lifespan is uh, genetically uh, determined. And it's important uh, that uh, probably for this reason that uh, life expectancy is still rising in all in the rich countries, but uh, less than in the poor countries, because we are uh, now close from this uh, kind of uh, limit. And, uh, and how can we change this? Uh, we can change this. Uh, uh, by so I, I had one slide about this, but the the, the, the most promising aspect is certainly uh, gene therapies. So because gene therapies make it possible to change all genes, so and because uh, like I said also, uh, you can see that very similar animals, uh, close genetically close, they have very different uh, maximal lifespan. So it's uh, not something uh, science fiction or, well, it's science fiction at the moment, but I mean, not something totally uh, hypothetical that someday we will find a way to change uh, the maximal uh, lifespan by changing our genes. Uh, also, um, what I, uh, I, I was wanting to say, so that's, I will, I will come back to this. So that's one of the first uh, way to imagine. So another way is, uh, but that's that's for uh, not a uh, sorry, not a close future, but far further future is to use nan nanotechnology. So to have uh, nanorobots who will uh, destroy the uh, the viruses and the cells who are aging and replacing some. Uh, um, uh, some mechanism uh, who are in our body. Uh, so mm -hmm. another another way is maybe maybe there are products who can uh, replace the the change uh, caused by our aging in our uh, by um, let's say changing the proteins or by creating new proteins uh, that are causing aging. That's one other aspect. But um, coming back, maybe coming back to the, the beginning of, the, uh, of your question. Yes, indeed, uh, um, it's, it's kind of a mystery to me that uh, we progress, we really continue to progress for the average lifespan, but we really don't progress for the maximal lifespan. So it means that it's, it will be complicated, but it, uh, it will be uh, possible. And why is it possible? 
because uh, uh, gene therapy is possible. First reason. Okay, so I, I think maybe I, I framed the question um, differently and um, others, if you want to add to the conversation, please um, do so by unmuting yourself. So you mentioned that um, the, the old person living, let's say in their seventies right now, they have, they are already predisposed for a, um, diseases or death caused by, um, by uh, age-related issues. And you compared yeah. it to someone that is living in a poor country, but it's already in their younger age. So I would like to argue against that because the per I think the person who is living in a rich country in their 70s have lived seven, 70 years, but the person that are young, let's say they're in Syria, in a place that is subject to war and stabilities, the, the chance of leave that for that person to live up to even 50 might be not high. So yeah. I think what I would like to, so there is also, I think, of course, there might be some gene therapies, there might be some extraordinary cutting edge and technological solutions. But what I'm missing here is this humanistic systemic approach that, well, actually some people, they are predisposed to die even from non-longevity related issues as we saw, for example, in India, because of sea levels, or also because of, for example, in countries that are under sanctions, they are they haven't been able to receive drugs and medications that would actually enable them enable to to deliver the um, the longevity, if you like, therapies to people. So I am. So my question is, can right now, as we are standing with the current problems paradigms inequalities, discrimination, racism, all of these inequalities, systemic inequalities that we have in the world, are we set to define that longevity is actually just for rich people? Because poor people, they have to, first of all, come out of the survival and then think about, okay, how can I now live my life in such a way that is not only long, but also meaningful, peaceful? Uh, yeah. So my question is, it, this narrative, you mentioned also we need to change paradigms, we need to change narratives. You mentioned about the big uh, tech industry like Apple, um, Garmin, they're also actually using the gap that exists in the industry for opting out uh, and, and getting economic value. But at the same time, we're missing the uh, maybe the most vulnerable people from this conversation. That's why I brought this. Uh, uh, issue of um... okay uh, there, are, there, there are various parts of you uh, of your questions so first uh, uh, when I was saying uh, so I was saying the the remaining life expectancy of one baby in the poorest country in the world is less is more sorry than the remaining part of uh, life expectancy for the richest person in the world uh, if uh, she or he is older than 50 years but of course uh, the total uh, amount of uh, total uh, yeah total life would be uh, uh, longer for the rich people than for the uh, poor people that that's always the situation okay so maybe i was not clear for this but yeah for this i i of course uh, agree with you uh, second where i uh, where, where i uh, of course agree with you is that the situation is uh, the, the the life expectancy is uh, lower in poorer countries than in rich countries, but um, but even in the poorest countries in the world, the first cause of death is still um, uh, related. To, the first cause of uh, deaths is still related to old old age. So, for example, I have uh, one. Uh, a relative uh, person I know who has a fa family, the members of the fa her family in uh, Congo. Uh, her sister just uh, died uh, a few days ago. Uh, she died younger than most people would die here, but she, she still died of old age. She was uh, 60 years. And uh, she had another uh, family member. She, she died uh, when she was, uh, I think, uh, 55 or something like that. It was still related to old age. So the difference is um, people in all countries of the world, they die of old age, 
but they die younger in poorer countries than in richer countries. And uh, so for this, we need, uh, we, let's say, in my opinion, absolutely uh, need uh, new therapies. And it is important that these new therapies are available to uh, everybody, like uh, it should be important, but yeah, we see the uh, uh, on the practical side that uh, sadly it's not like that, uh, that the vaccination is uh, available in all countries. They were mm -hmm. coming to that, they were beautiful declarations uh, at the beginning of the crisis, but now uh, sadly it's not the situation. Even, I, I, I don't know about the situation in Ireland, I don't know, but I well, in some countries, it's there is, there are still uh, vaccination, uh, but not enough for sure. I wanted um, to ask uh, a related question. Uh, you don't need to convince me that uh, a general uh, treatment for that would increase longevity would be a good thing, but. What you are proposing is a big public investment, and that means that you need to convince the public institutions to put a lot of money into that, and then you will get the standard question, yes, but why do people need to live longer? Isn't aging yeah. natural? Isn't it normal that they die? Uh, yeah. why, why should we put all that into just making people live longer than their natural life expectancy. So the new narrative needs to be there. And then yeah. we need to give arguments that would convince, let's say, the man in the street that this is a good investment. So yeah, what, yeah. what that, kind that, of a narrative would you use for that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, uh, well, I, I, I made many conferences about all these aspects, but uh, to be short, uh, well, the, the, well, first, uh, uh, why? Life is precious. All life are precious, and uh, life of all people are precious as well. And uh, if you consider that life is precious, uh, since the first cause of that is uh, diseases related to old age, uh, there is nothing more important than to save lives. So there is nothing more important than to save lives uh, related to uh, old age. Then after that, uh, I know that there are people saying, "Okay, we should." Uh, uh, we should uh, stop somewhere, but uh, if we consider that we should we should follow, let's say the natural way, uh, in a natural way, uh, about uh, 30 to 60 percent of uh, children die before they are five years old, and we don't. Nobody is uh, now saying, uh, oh, uh, 50 percent of uh, the children should die before they are 50, five years of old, uh, five years of, of age. Actually, we are, I think, and this is kind of a, uh, a complicated question, complicated question, but I think that most people uh, say we should not live longer because we don't have a choice. This is called, uh, the, the, the theory is called uh, the terror management theory. So uh, dying of old age is something uh, awful uh, that nobody actually would want if we had a choice. But since we don't have a choice, we have to think that dying of old age is something positive, is something that uh, uh, must happen. It's something that it's good for the society. Okay, that's one category. The, so the second thing I want to say, maybe uh, even more important, is uh, I think that, uh, uh, so human beings love each other, but not enough. Uh, human beings uh, are peaceful, but not enough. Uh, we are contrary to what many people think. We are less um, less viol violent than before, but we have more capacities to be violent. It's uh, it's easier to kill people than ever before. So um, have a more peaceful wor world. Uh, sorry, one world where let's suppose uh, one world where, where people don't die of old age. Old age, life will become more precious. And uh, killing other people will not be only some kind of a crime, but it will be almost in unthinkable. Because, mm -hmm. uh, well, no, if you kill somebody, uh, you just, let's say, accelerate his death because he's going to die uh, anyway. If you kill somebody who is not dying of old age, you could lose uh, thousands of years from, for him. That's one second uh, aspect. A third aspect is about environment. 
So uh, some people will say, yeah, if people live longer, um, the, 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 there will be ocean. Uh, so first, that's not true because it's in countries where people live short lives that there is overpopulation. It's uh, in sub saharan countries that you have uh, more than two or three uh, children per, uh, per child, not in uh, Japan, uh, France, Belgium. Uh, that's one aspect. But also, uh, if people can live more than 100 years, they, uh, they need... Uh, um, they need a sustainable planet to be able to live longer. So they will be more careful for their environment. That's a, a, a third uh, aspect. Uh, and coming to violence, I, so we live in a world of, uh, of like I said, uh, no, we live in a world of beautiful technological progress, some aspects, but also very, very dangerous, uh, incredibly dangerous uh, uh, technical progress. So, if we want to, let's say, to have uh, humanity living longer than the next century, we need to diminish uh, existential risk. And one existential risk is um, human violence. And one way to diminish human violence is to make life more precious. But this is only uh, one part of the answer, to be honest, because existential uh, risk are, are a, a very big uh, question. But uh, yeah. The, the answer I was thinking about, if you want to convince uh, public institutions to put yeah. in money, is that aging the way it functions now costs an enormous amount of yeah, yeah, yes. money. Uh, I was... All these old people that are in old people's home, it costs an enormous amount. If those people could stay 10 years longer staying in their own home without needing the care, it would be an enormous saving of, of, of yeah. money. Yeah, yeah. And also, I, I was, I think, okay, well, go go ahead after I will, example, I will come back to this. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Because because you mentioned right now um, the majority of uh, age-related deaths are from cardiovascular diseases, neurodegenerative diseases, and also cancer and other yes. description of infectious diseases that you mentioned. But I argue that actually it's these diseases are not age-related diseases. Cardiovascular diseases sometimes are actually habit-related diseases. People have been living in a way that were actually not healthy to their bodies, so they develop cardiovascular diseases that will cause them to, to die earlier than they should. So this is not age-related. This is more, in my perspective or and thinking so far, it's more also part of it might be genetic susceptibility, susceptibility but also can be not being a, a careful about what they're doing and not taking care of themselves and, and, yeah. and, uh, and aspects like that. So I think the argument of age-related diseases should be actually what causes humans to age faster than they are aging normally because we age anyway. It's not just, we don't want to think about just dying. We are aging, but at different speeds. And that is, I think, something that is uh, that I felt is missing from the argument that if we if you want to convince people to to invest on these resources or public or private or maybe institutions that they have enough resources to invest in longevity research and also promoting longevity, first of all, we need to understand what is causing us to actually age er faster than we should. So because we have a metabolic age. We have different types of age. Your body has different biological aging, but also metabolic age. So some people are metabolically older than they should. So you receive 25 years old young person, young man or young woman, that their metabolic age is actually 50 years old. What has caused that? And how they how we can yeah. shift the narrative that to, to understand well. The, a big part of uh, longevity is not gene therapy, is actually behavior therapy. Okay, but, uh, okay. I, I will uh, uh, first answer to Francis and then to you, because I, I want to, uh, to, to Francis, I just want to say that I totally agree. That's uh, one uh, uh, other aspect, that's uh, uh, money aspect. And uh, so uh, one way to convince is to say that it doesn't cost money, it's, uh, uh, bringing back money, so you have to inf invest in science. And uh, uh, each time that you win uh, one month of uh, 
healthy life expectancy, uh, you have a, a growing GDP of zero point uh, something. And um, when uh, in uh, increase where life expectancy is rising, the GDP is rising. Uh, and uh, what is very cost, uh, contrary to what, to what most people think, uh, medical costs are not related uh, to age, they are related to the age of death. That's uh, different. Uh, so uh, th that's the last uh, one, two or four, five years, but especially the last, the, even especially this, the last uh, six months of life are the most costly than the last 12 months and so on. So when you raise the life expectancy, you, uh, you have less money to pay. Also, it seems, but that maybe that's maybe not true. But it seems that uh, people who are dying later have less less medical cost. But that's maybe not true. Well, to go into de details, maybe it's because when people are very old, uh, there are less investment to try to save them. Okay, now going to your uh, to your question. Um, uh, I, I I'm I'm sorry, but I I disagree. I would say. Uh, in a country like Belgium, um, if you have, well, of, there, there is one thing that you, uh, if you are doing that, you live really shorter life, that is if you smoke. But for the rest, uh, if you, if you, for the, for the rest, uh, there are not so many differences between a good uh, behavior and a bad behavior. There are differences, of course, but not so many, not, not so much, because uh, uh, people who who are who have a very good uh, uh, way to live, they will live maybe five to ten or maximum fifteen years, uh, fifteen years more. And people who have a, a be very bad uh, behavior, they will be they will live uh, maybe five years less. But actually, no. In uh, in a country like Belgium, I think that the I don't know exactly, but the median uh, death age, so the the age when most people are are, are dead, uh, it's something like eighty two or something like that. Uh, so the biggest difference between the biggest difference uh, is between poor and rich. And also between man and uh, men and women, but the other differences are less important. And uh, also, when you say, uh, okay, these are the, the diseases like cardiovascular diseases, uh, uh, cancers, and uh, Alzheimer diseases are not related to old age. Yes, they are really, there is uh, something called the Gompertz curve. So your chance to die next year is doubling each eight years, okay? So I don't know how old you are, but certainly younger than, than I am. Uh, you change you change to, or you risk to, to die uh, of old age is really lower than my risk. And is it, this is like that uh, in general, but this is like that for cancer, this is like that for cardiovascular diseases, and uh, even more for, um, for uh, neurodegenerative diseases. After that, when you say there is, you, you said, okay, we will die anyway of old age. Well, of course, no, this is the situation, but I don't think that it will be, uh, that it's sure it will be the situation ever. That's, that's uh, let's say the central no, no, no. point. I didn't money. say, uh, I don't say that we are, we die of old age anyway. I said we are aging anyway. This is what yeah, I okay. mentioned. Yeah, I so we are that. aging. Yeah, because these are two, two different uh, things. Uh, that's, um, yeah, but, so I, okay, uh, but, uh, I don't have any yeah. more questions. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to yes, say that I, I disagree with uh, Didier about the fact that lifestyle factors are not that important. From statistics, you may not see a big difference. You may see 10 or, or 15 years, but that is because these statistics, as you yourself indicate, they use very rough data. They use data like, are you obese? Do you smoke? Are you a man or a woman? and how, how rich are you? And that's about it. I think that there are much finer uh, ways of measuring uh, your lifestyle. 
things like a diet, like sports, like uh, activities, like supplements. And I'm pretty sure that each of these will have some small effect and all together will have a big effect. That's more difficult to prove because there are so many factors. And if your big data project would go too, probably you would see that the if you are able to make more fine-grained distinctions between different lifestyles, that the difference between the people with the worst lifestyles and the best lifestyles is much more than 15 years. I'm pretty sure about that. If I if I may answer on, in two aspects. First, I, I, I like statistics. I love statistics since many years. Uh, before I was interested in uh, longevity. And uh, one thing I, I always liked also before I was interested in longevity there was uh, statistics concerning life expectancy. And since uh, now a few, quite a few years, I will put it in the chat. I keep one uh, uh, file uh, that I uh, call uh, vivre plus longtemps selon les statistiques, uh, life longer uh, following statistics. And so uh, you are right that there are many uh, aspects. So, so to live longer, uh, you have to be, well, of course, healthy, uh, non-smoking, but also eating fish, uh, uh, making sport, uh, living in good neighbors, uh, uh, being more educated. Well, there are uh, dozens of things, but no, I'm coming. I, uh, as far as I know, and I'm, I'm quite convinced about that, uh, they are not cumulative, you know? Because, okay, for example, being well educated and being rich, there is a strong correlation. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's not one plus one is two, it's one plus one is maybe 1.1 or something like that. Uh, then the second aspect is uh, uh, nowadays in a country like Belgium, uh, most people, they reach their uh, 75 years, they, they, they become 75 years old. So even if they have a bad, bad uh, habits, they, they don't live so much uh, shorter lives. And the differences are, let's say, uh, uh, less important. But I, I, I will never say that they are not important. Eh? But uh, there's something called, uh, I, I don't know what it is in English, but uh, rectangularization. I don't know if it is correct in English. So uh, the way people were dying before, there was kind of a, a progressive line like this, and now it's more like that. Up, up. You know, uh, you wish, uh, let's say, in in very uh, simplified way before. A plateau. Yeah, kind of a plateau. So in a very simplified way, people before. They were dying when they were 30, 40, 50, 60, and it, it was uh, increasing, but not very, uh, very fast. And no, they are not dying before they are 60, and then it's going very fast until 90. But yeah, 50, 55, 70. No, no, in Belgium, uh, medical doctors or scientists they will they will speak about uh, a too early death when you are 75 old, years old. So, and an, a normal death, it's when you are 80 years old. So the difference is, uh, is smaller than before. But still, uh, of course, it is important. But also, of course, in my point of view, this is nothing uh, if you compare with the possibilities that you can have uh, uh, with uh, gene therapies. And uh, also, coming, coming back to the, the last uh, remark, for me, uh, Dying of aging and uh, diseases related to old age, uh, and uh, um, uh, what was the distinction? And aging itself—that's the same thing. You know, there there is no such thing, in my opinion, at least, and in the opinion of most uh, people uh, studying the the question, there is no uh, such thing of like uh, aging without dying of aging. It doesn't exist. If, if the, the 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 let's say really the if you take a look at the definition of aging for, uh, for medical doctors, you, you will see that the definition of aging it's really having uh, a declining health, and the end of declining health is death. Mm. 
Um, so, uh, well, thank you very much, Didier, for this presentation. Yeah. Very informative, a lot of things to, to, to think about. Thank you very much. Uh, um, I wonder if... I just need to... Uh, so, um, if there is any final thoughts or fi fi uh, final comments, because I need to close this uh, meeting uh, in a few minutes. Uh, so, uh, if there is any final thoughts, anyone wants to share anything uh, uh, less than one minute, I will appreciate it. Merci. Merci. Very interesting meeting. And uh, I'm sorry, Didier, huh? I disagree with you huh? on the uh, type of life. The, my feeling is there is impact on the longevity, yeah, sure. Sure. epigenetic. Sure, sure. But thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your participation. Yes. Um, uh, maybe the, the last thing I, I want to say that's about all this. Uh, let's say, uh, social, uh, political, uh, and uh, equality uh, questions. So I want to say that uh, since I'm, uh, I'm young, uh, for me, it was always important to, um, to fight uh, against uh, uh, hunger in the world and uh, against uh, people dying of, uh, because they don't have enough to eat. And many, many, many years, I was giving money uh, for NGOs for this. And one day I was trying to think about, uh, so I knew that there were people dying of uh, hunger, but there were also people dying of uh, easy to escape uh, diseases. And then I was asking myself, what are diseases, uh, diseases that you can escape, uh, easy to escape? And then when I was studying this, I was, think, I was discovering that there are people who think that we should avoid uh, to, to die of diseases related to old age. And that's what convinced me uh, to, be, uh, to be active in this field. So I want to say for me, but also for other people, uh, that's because I want more uh, equality and more happiness in the world uh, for, for everybody, and especially for the people who have shorter lives that I want to uh, live um, I, I want uh, to study how to make it possible for everybody to live uh, without time limits, but it's not for tomorrow, of course. And I'm not, uh, not naive about this. This is not for tomorrow. It's not easy. And uh, today, the best way to have uh, longer lives is to, to have a healthy environment in a, in a forest, for example, <laughs> like Francis. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, everyone. Uh, Mont, uh, Francis, for joining today. Uh, the recording will be available online. And uh, I think today people could enjoy maybe um, uh, there, there, there will be more questions when, when the recordings are available on our YouTube channel. Again, thank you so much. And if uh, I'm going to close now the meeting, uh, okay. have a good evening, everyone. Okay. Bye. Bye bye. 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 bye.